Guan Yu was born in Unchang in Shanxi province, rising to fame as a general fighting for the state of Shu. Of all the heroes of the Three Kingdoms, he is perhaps the most iconic. Yet strangely, in Records of the Three Kingdoms, though noted for his bravery and loyalty, he's a relatively minor figure, mentioned only in passing. But in Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it's different. Here, Guan Yu is described at length and in detail, acquiring the features that have almost become his trademark. The booming voice, the long beard, the upturned eyes and arched eyebrows, the brown weather-beaten face. And stories about him are not just preserved in works of classic literature. Countless folk tales about him survive too, passed down the generations for almost 2,000 years. What's more, there are probably more statues of him than any other historical figure. No wonder people in China have such a clear idea of Guan Yu, the brave, loyal, kind, and just general. In 1724, dozens of merchants in Shu Shijian in Hunan province gathered at the temple of Guan Yu. 
They were here to discuss an important matter affecting the reputation of all members of the business community. There had been accusations of unfair trading. Unscrupulous merchants were using steel yard balances of varying sizes in order to deceive their customers. Therefore, publicly, in front of the statue of Guan Yu, they undertook to adopt a standard steel yard and agreed that anyone found using a non-standard one to deceive customers would have to pay out of his own pocket for an opera troupe to entertain the whole town for three days. Twenty years after this gathering, merchants hailing from Shanxi and Shanxi expanded the Temple of Guan Yu in Shuqi Dian into the Guild Hall of Shanxi and Shanxi. Over the next 136 years, it was expanded yet further. By 1892, it was the largest Shanxi and Shanxi Guild Hall in the country. During the Qing Dynasty, Shanxi merchants prospered, setting up shops throughout the country. Far from home, it was natural for them to look to Guan Yu, their province's most famous son, for spiritual support and guidance. So it was that Guan Yu temples became the focus of community life for Shanxi people, plying their trade far from home, places to meet and make connections places to come in times of need. As guild halls sprung up around these temples, Guan Yu came to symbolize the fair dealing and honest practices of the Shanxi merchants, the god of fortune that had blessed their endeavors with success and prosperity. Chinese 最早金凤的财神不是关羽有范礼仪什么赵公民这一类的人中国人把他奉为财神的目的是想取一个诚信在生意场中国传统的一个训诫叫义内求财生财有道义内求财也强调一个义字于是人们也就把关羽呢因重义重情奉为财神。The Temple of Guan Yu in Yunchang, Shanxi Province, is considered to be the earliest of its kind in China. The four characters hanging in the main hall were written by Emperor Kang Shi of the Qing Dynasty in praise of Guan Yu's uprightness and loyalty. To the rear of the temple is the Spring and Autumn Tower, which houses a statue of Guan Yu, reading Zhou's commentary on the Spring and Autumn Annals. It is said that Guan Yu liked reading Zhou's commentary and knew it by heart. Even before Romance of the Three Kingdoms was completed, the image of Guan Yu reading Zhou's commentary on the Spring and Summer Annals by candlelight was already quite firmly established, having appeared in verses dating from the Yuan Dynasty during the Ming and Qing dynasties, spring and autumn towers were added to many Guan Yu temples. Nowadays, there is no Guan Yu temple, incomplete without a spring and autumn tower, containing a statue of the great man reading that classic work by candlelight. How did that come to be? First, 他经过孔子之手
Guan Yu's decapitated head was interred in the mausoleum of Guan Yu in Luoyang. There are four large characters written on the gate of the mausoleum, proclaiming the virtue associated with the great man, loyalty, righteousness, benevolence, and bravery. For over a thousand years now, Guan Yu, a general of the Three Kingdoms period, has symbolized these values to countless worshippers. But what exactly is righteousness? As Confucius pointed out in the Analects, the superior man, the ideal gentleman, would put righteousness before any other consideration. In that sense, righteousness is the quality that defines nobility, that demonstrates a person's superiority. The essence of righteousness is that a code of conduct shapes and guides a person's life. Confucianists praise Guan Yu as a saint because they saw him as an exemplar of righteousness. Reading Zhou's commentary on the spring and autumn annals at night came to symbolize Guan Yu's righteousness, his dedication to Confucian ideals. The emphasis on righteousness is sufficiently reflected in Oath of the Peach Garden, the first chapter of Romance of the Three Kingdoms. In the novel, Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei became sworn brothers in the Peach Garden on the day after they met. The famous saying has been passed down since then. The saying goes, We seek not to be born on the same day, in the same month, and in the same year. We merely hope to die on the same day, in the same month, and in the same year. In the Three 却并没有刘官张三人举行结拜举行结义的这样一个形式只是说他们三人关系很好恩若兄弟但并在是出现了资本主义社会的蒙牙就有大量的农村人口涌入到城市当城当城市平民城市工人中国人无意识感情的东西主要是什么血缘亲戚兄弟就是一种血缘和亲戚所以说结拜为兄弟就遭到一种威胁的流带所以到了明朝那个罗贯中写三国演义的时候啊就受到这样一种社会氛围的影响The San Yi Palace in Zhuzhou, Hebei province, was originally built during the Sui Dynasty. In 1508, Emperor Zhang Duo of the Ming Dynasty ordered it rebuilt. The stone tablet in it records that Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei became sworn brothers here. The inscriptions were written by scholar Zhou Fang, handwritten by senior official Zhou Hui Chou and carved by imperial preceptor Zhang Mao. This demonstrates how much importance the imperial authorities attached to the sworn brotherhood that supposedly existed between these men. The story of the oath in the peach garden has been passed down for hundreds of years. Everyone knows about it. The line about seeking to die on the same day in the same month and in the same year is one that moved a great many people and came to be seen as the essence of sworn brotherhood. In the novel, Liu Bei, Zhang Fei, and Guan Yu vowed to unite their efforts to save those in difficulty and in danger, to do their bit for the country and its people by bringing peace and unity, values and ideals that author Luo Guanzhong was especially keen to promote. Although sworn brotherhood was by no means a new idea, having been advocated in popular literature and art in both the Song and Yuan dynasties, Luo Guanzhong's ideal of brotherhood differed in the special emphasis it placed on loyalty and righteousness. Nan Song开始, 
，这个无论是这个小说还戏剧各种形式的这个这个关羽的形象，就开始更为明显的跟忠义这个价值观相挂钩。之前其实并没有强调这一点，就是从南宋开始特别强调这个。这跟整个中国文化的走势实际上是相关联的，所以说呢，后来呢，关羽就越来越这个成为一个就是中国人忠义观当中的一个非常理想化的一个人物，或者说他是中国忠义观的一个一个代表性的人物。That countless people were inspired to emulate its leading characters, especially Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei. Indeed, even emperors were inspired by the book. For example, the Manchu warlords who founded the Qing Dynasty were big fans of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms even before they took power. In 1639, Guang Taiji ordered the novel translated into Manchu, his mother tongue. It took more than a decade, but by 1650, the Manchu language version of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms was complete. According to historical records, Emperor Shunzhu of the Qing Dynasty became sworn brothers with some Mongol chieftains, referring to himself as Liu Bei and the Mongol chieftains as Guan Yu. Some historians argue that this Three Kingdoms-inspired Qing policy pacified the Mongol tribes. Ensuring that they were content to remain on the northern fringes of the country for more than 200 years. According to Chen Shao's records of the Three Kingdoms, Liu Bei was defeated in Shuzhou, and Guan Yu was captured by Cao Cao. In the following Battle of Guangdu, Guan Yu made an outstanding achievement. So Cao Cao submitted a report to the imperial court. Suggesting making Guan Yu the Ting Marquis of Han Shou, but though Guan Yu was in Cao Cao's camp, he remained loyal to Liu Bei. Declining rewards and honors, he left in search of Liu Bei. This episode is only sketchily recorded in historical sources, but is a major episode in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, described over the course of four chapters. In these, Luo Guanzhong. Demonstrates Guan Yu's righteousness and loyalty to Liu Bei and their brotherhood. These four chapters contain several unforgettable episodes, nowadays inextricably linked to the public mind, with Guan Yu and his character. These include leaving Cao Cao. And returning to Liu Bei's side, reading Zhou's commentary on the spring and autumn annals throughout the night, beheading Yan Liang, killing Wen Chou, declining rewards and resigning, lifting the robe Cao Cao offered with his broadsword, fighting his way through five passes, and killing six generals, and killing Dai Yang, and being reunited with Liu Bei. All of these exciting events demonstrate Guan Yu's high morality and noble personality, and it's the final scene that makes the greatest impression on people. When, after his long and difficult journey, the loyal, upright, and brave Guan Yu was reunited with Liu Bei.从小说的宣扬里面，把义的东西提高了很高的层面了。再就是把忠的东西，在我们看一部小说里面就宣扬了一个忠义最核心的东西——忠是第一的。在忠的旗号下，就是义是第二的。义是第二的。我们看看，加
In the novel, the Allied forces of Sun Quan and Liu Bei attack Cao Cao's army with fire in the Battle of the Red Cliff. Defeated, Cao Cao was forced to flee, eventually running into Guan Yu's army. His army demoralized. Cao Cao had no choice but to beg Guan Yu for mercy. As he'd treated Guan Yu with courtesy previously, he had high hopes that Guan Yu would release him. Guan Yu answered that killing Yan Liang and Wen Chou and breaking the siege of Bai Ma more than repaid Cao Cao for his kindness. So to begin with, he refused to let Cao Cao go. Guan Yu no choice. His heart is very because Guan Yu is fighting with his heart. If he leaves Cao Cao, he has to go back to Aidao. If he doesn't leave Cao Cao, he will leave a bad name. Guan Yu is not talking about each other. So in the name and the life of the two points, Guan Yu is constantly fighting. He finally decided that he will die, he will leave his own name, his own name. The Chinese army is So after much agonizing, Guan Yu decided to let Cao Cao go. Cao Cao had been his benefactor. Guan Yu had an obligation to him. In the Battle of the Red Cliff, the Allied forces of Sun Quan and Liu Bei defeated Cao Cao. But Guan Yu had done something unforgivable. He'd let the enemy go. It's important to understand that in his portrayal of Guan Yu, Luo Guanzhong was both humanizing him and endowing him with the virtues of Confucianism. In violating basic military principles and putting his personal gratitude ahead of the interests of the alliance, Luo Guanzhong showed that Guan Yu was a man who valued righteousness above all else. All other considerations were secondary to him. In that sense, he embodies Confucius's ideal of the superior man, man who is prepared to do what's right, whatever the consequences to him personally. Guan Yu knew that his life was forfeit if he let Zhao Chao go, but he did it all the same. Readers of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms are left no doubt that Guan Yu represents the essence of the Confucian ideal. So关羽的意,统治者欢迎的,中军大义。江湖上欢迎的,桃园情义。个人老百姓欢迎的,个人恩义。这三个东西指向一个意,包含三个层面,体现了关羽的人格理想。作者他的身上记得了一种人格理想
He ordered that in the complete library in four sections that was then being compiled, the posthumous title of Guan Yu should be changed to Zhong Yi, meaning loyalty and righteousness.那么在历史上那个四号定呢以后就是我们常说叫盖棺论定一字定终身是不能够再去改呢北宋以后官员的四号就发生了很大的变化一直到清代的时候慢慢在变他一开始由侯到公到王到君到帝这样一个一个变化
By the Tang Dynasty, the image of the handsome, righteous, and brave Guan Yu, the warrior who could take on 10,000 men single-handedly, was a well-established poetic trope. At the end of the Northern Song Dynasty, Guan Yu's reputation was so well-established that even more posthumous titles were conferred on him. Even so, iconic figure though he'd become, Guan Yu had a long way to go before he entered the Chinese pantheon. In 219, while Guan Yu was locked in battle with Cao Cao's army in Fancheng, Sun Quan of the Wu state sent Liu Meng, a chief commander, to secretly cross the Yangtze River. They occupied Jianling, where Guan Yu's base camp was located. Guan Yu was under attack front and rear and was forced to withdraw to Mai Cheng. Finally run to ground by the Wu army, he died in Danyang, Hubei province. In Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Luo Guanzhong wrote that Guan Yu was 58 years old when he died. As for Guan Yu's final moments, the history books say nothing. All we have to go on is Luo Guanzhong's romanticized version. The great Guan Yu cornered, howling to the sky. The magnificent green dragon crescent blade that had seen him through so much, now dull its magical sheen gone. Decapitated on the orders of Sun Quan, Guan Yu's head was sent to Chao Chao, who buried it with great honors in Luoyang, Henan province. Sun Quan, however, also revered Guan Yu, burying his body with full honors. As the saying goes, head pillowed in Luoyang, body lying in Danyang, soul returned to his ancestral home, three resting places for Guan Yu, mighty hero of the Three Kingdoms. Maybe his soul eventually found refuge here, in the Temple of Guan Yu, in Haizhou, Yuncheng, Shanxi Province, his birthplace. In the aftermath of Guan Yu's demise, Sun Quan occupied most of Jingzhou. Consequently, the Shu state lost land and population that it could ill afford to lose. Zhuge Liang's strategy of retaining Jingzhou and Yizhou at the same time was shattered. The loss of Jingzhou may be attributed to many causes, not least Guan Yu's arrogance and inability to comprehend the overall strategic situation. In Chen Shou's opinion, Guan Yu's arrogance and other shortcomings made failure inevitable. So it's perhaps ironic that a general who was defeated and killed in battle ended up being deified and worshipped across the country as the personification of the soldierly virtues of bravery and honor, overshadowing even Liu Bei and Sun Quan. Because of that, many historians are perplexed by the Guan Yu and his enduring reputation. In Conversation on Chinese History by the Hudson River, historian Ray Huang wrote that Guan Yu didn't know his subordinates well, misjudged his enemy's situation, and was careless with his flanks, leading his army into danger. Unaware of his own shortcomings as leader, morale in Guan Yu's army plummeted, in the end collapsing with barely a struggle. Yet bizarrely, Despite the definite historical track record, Chinese people still came to regard Guan Yu as their god of war. Surely the gap between Guan Yu, the real life leader, and Guan Yu, the legend, is something that is crying out to be explained.
Zhao Yi, a Qing Dynasty historian, raised similar questions in his own book. He wrote that usually hero worship of this sort lasts a few centuries after the death of the hero. If that's the case, then Guan Yu represents a strange exception. Before the Tang Dynasty, he was largely ignored. Ever since, his reputation has gone from strength to strength. Uh 一个人成功了，大家都说得好；一个人失败了，说那个家伙我早就看他不顺眼，总有一天要再跟他过，永远不行，是吧？比比皆是。但是关羽的形象上发生的一些变化，人们没有以成败的英雄。As everyone knows, in the romance of the three kingdoms, Luo Guangzhong didn't skate over Guan Yu's military failures and character flaws. On the contrary. There's a strong note of moral criticism in his depictions of the conflict between Guan Yu and the Wu state. As Mao Zongang, a Qing dynasty critic, remarked, it was the Wu state that broke the alliance with the Shu state in the first place. Guan Yu's response was excessive, and Liu Meng resorted to trickery, directly resulting in the loss of Jingzhou. Guan Yu's reputation rests entirely on his moral conduct his moral superiority, as conceived in Confucian terms, not his strengths as a military leader. Luo Guanzhong's achievement in the romance was to use the historical material to create a character who could not be judged purely on the basis of success or failure, effectively overthrowing a system of values that placed too much emphasis on worldly success. In this way, he elevated Guan Yu to a more spiritual plane laying the foundations for his immortality. In the end, Luo Guanzhong's Guan Yu made a final appearance from beyond the grave, returning to wreak vengeance on Liu Meng. In the process, his ghost startled even Chao Chao. Perhaps Guan Yu's disembodied last bow made his deification inevitable. But the process by which Guan Yu was transformed from a man into a god was a complicated one. One of the stories goes that in 592, Master Zhu Yi, originator of the Tiantai sect of Buddhism, returned to his hometown, Jingzhu. There, he established a temple on Yu Chuan Mountain, applying Bodhisattva precepts to Guan Yu's soul. So it was that in addition to his posthumous titles, Guan Yu was posthumously converted to Buddhism. A hundred years later, Master Shen Xiu of the Chan sect arrived at Yu Chuan Mountain and constructed a temple as well, making Guan Yu a guardian deity. From then on, stories about Guan Yu's holy powers proliferated, transforming him from a historical figure into a religious one. But Taoism, China's native religion, wanted in on the act too. During the Song Dynasty, rumor had it that in Haizhou of Shanxi province, Guan Yu's hometown, the yield of the salt pond dropped for some unknown reason. According to the heavenly master, Zhang Qi Xian, this was caused by the god Qi Yo. Naturally, when told this, Emperor Hui Zong asked, who can defeat him? Guan Yu. I have already told him to do it, answered Zhang Qi Shan. Soon enough, the yield of the salt pond was back to normal. Impressed, Emperor Hui Zong, a devout Taoist, 
made Guan Yu into immortal of lofty peace. In the Ming Dynasty, Emperor Shen Zong, who was also a devout Taoist, conferred another title on Guan Yu, Emperor Xiatian. Xiatian means assisting the heaven. In the following years, he bestowed higher and higher honors on Guan Yu. By 1614, Guan Yu had become the imperial sovereign Sate Guan, great emperor who defeats the demons of the three realms and heavenly lord known from afar for his divine power. Ban Thanks to the unremitting efforts of Emperor Hui Zong of Song, Guan Yu finally had a temple of his own. In 20 years, the emperor had heaped honors on him. In the Tang Dynasty, the dominant figure in temples to the god of war had been Zhang Ziya, and Guan Yu was only one of the 64 subordinate generals. Temples of Guan Yu, where Guan Yu was the dominant figure, appeared during the reign of Emperor Chen Song of Sun. After Zhu Yanzhang became the emperor of the Ming Dynasty, he had a temple dedicated to the god of war, constructed in Nanjing in 1394. Zhang Ziya was taken out and the temple of Guan Yu replaced it as one of the nine temples of the capital. In 1665, in the Qing Dynasty, Guan Yu's status was promoted again, and he was afforded the same status as Confucius. In 1730, Guan Yu was honored as the saint of war, with the temple of Guan Yu regarded on the same level as the Confucian temple. The spirit of Guan Yu, honored in Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, as well as by the Shu state, the Song and Ming dynasties, was reborn 1,000 years after his death. Nobotai这些杂乱的民间信仰里边的 the Temple of Guan Yu in his hometown, Haizhou of Shangji Province, was the first built in the Sui Dynasty. It was expanded and rebuilt in the Song and Ming Dynasties. It covers a total of 220,000 square meters and has over 200 rooms. It is the largest existing palace-style Taoist architectural complex. It is regarded as the ancestor of all temples of Guan Yu. Upon arrival, civilian officials had to get out of their sedan chairs and military officers had to dismount. There are three temple gates. While the Zhu gate in the center was reserved for emperors, the Wenjing Gate in the east was for officials, and the Wu Wei Gate in the west for military officers. Inside the temple are countless plaques offered by people from all walks of life. The inscriptions on some boards were handwritten by emperors. Emperors Kung Shi, Chen Long, and Shen Feng all praised Guan Yu's righteousness and bravery. For over a thousand years, people of all classes praised Guan Yu. 
In all China's long history, Guan Yu is unique in being honored so widely and for so long. Xu Wei, a Ming Dynasty scholar, once remarked that the temples of Guan Yu could be found all over the country. According to him, the acceptance of Guan Yu as a deity and Confucian ideal were equally accepted wherever you went in China. These core beliefs were part of what it meant to be Chinese. But while Confucian temples could only be found in prefectural capitals and county seats, temples of Guan Yu abounded. From the largest city to the tiniest village, every settlement had a Guan Yu temple. The popularity of Guan Yu was simply unprecedented. And nor was it restricted to soldiers and military men. People in fields as varied as tobacco, joss stick and candle production, even education, all worshipped him. Belief in Guan Yu literally spanned the country. In the Ming Dynasty, all the main passes through the Great Wall had a temple of Guan Yu. Whether setting out for battle or returning, Guan Yu was there to greet his fellow soldiers. These three stone tablets from the Qing Dynasty are still standing in this ancient building. Bearing 18 rules of conduct agreed on by the merchants of the town, it was placed here in 1785. It's significant that they chose to take the oath to abide by this pledge in the Temple of Guan Yu. Clearly, they all believed that a promise made under Guan Yu's stern gaze was a promise that would be kept. A rough translation of the inscription on the tablet reads, People are not as honest as they used to be. Rules are being neglected. All the merchants are worried. Therefore, we have gathered here to agree on rules to keep men honest. Adhering to these 18 rules will be to everyone's benefit. Win-win.